Thank you. Uh, I would also like to thank, start by thanking the organisers for getting, uh, giving me a chance to present this work here today. Uh, so what I'll tell you about today is some of our experimental work uh, looking at objects like this. This is a picture of the device I'll tell you about today. And this is a, a sort of funny uh, type of transmon qubit we made where uh, the capacitance of this qubit is formed from a, a vacuum gap parallel plate capacitor. And, uh, and we connected this, uh, we hung this capacitor freestanding directly over the top of the feed line of a coplanar waveguide cavity that contains our microwave photons. Um, <coughs> so, and in, uh, in what we, uh, so using this device, we uh, ac sort of accidentally actually entered into a regime of ultra strong coupling between the photons in this cavity and the state of this artificial atom. I'll tell you uh, a bit about that today. And also by trying to understand the results that we had quantitatively, uh, we also developed a, a sort of cute way of understanding uh, the, the physics of this ultrasound coupling regime, in particular of the lamp shift, and in particular the convergence of the lamp shift in multi-mode uh, quantum electrodynamics, or at least in circuit electrodynamics. So uh, I want to tell you brief, give you a brief overview of the group that, that I have in Delft. So our, uh, these days we work entirely on uh, what I'll kind of call quantum circuits. These are gigahertz microwave circuits uh, in our, that operate in our dilution refrigerator, and we pursue three different research directions. Our biggest research direction is actually studying uh, mechanical objects like this metal drum or this vibrating membrane using these quantum circuits, uh, and we have two other activities. Uh, so briefly, because it's a little bit related to what, uh, what we did in the end, uh, say one of the goals in this uh, main focus of my group is to try to bring the control that people have of, of the quantum state of artificial atoms or real atoms uh, to uh, these macroscopic vibrating objects. And the idea is, uh, there's sort of two motivations for this. The first is that this guy here in particular, the silicon nitride membrane that we work with, he can have extremely long coherence times uh, on the order of thermal decoherence times on the order of 100 milliseconds right now. And uh, the current technological developments in these mechanical objects suggest thermal decoherence times on the order of 10 seconds or longer is possible soon. Uh, so one, uh, one motivation for studying things like this, mechanics, is, is to take advantage of the extremely high coherence uh, that we can achieve with these objects. The other is a little bit exploratory because uh, people have made lots of uh, studied quantum mechanics with objects such as atoms or, or artificial atoms for a long time now, and people understand that quantum mechanics applies very beautifully for these systems, it's quite well understood. Uh, but there is still some question about whether or not quantum mechanics would apply to massive or macroscopic objects. Macroscopic is a bit of a loaded word, but I use that here in the context of at least heavy things. So if I make something heavy, there are some people who think that quantum mechanics should maybe act differently. And that's something that hopefully when we bring these experiments up to speed, we should be able to start to explore. So, uh, but actually I'll tell you today about uh, a, a, a sort of a topic that we've been working on in a different part of the group, a related part of the group, where we use sort of uh, these quantum circuits uh, more to do sort of analog quantum engineering, where we play around with Hamiltonians by designing uh, circuits in the clean room. So, uh, and that's this topic here, this, uh, uh, this topic of ultron coupling in a vacuum gap qubit. So, uh, First, to give a sort of general overview, uh, this is what these type of qubits typically look like. So what you see up here, <coughs> this is a, a photograph of a transmon qubit uh, from Yale, I believe, uh, or uh, from Roloff, I'm not sure now. Uh, and this is, a, this is a parallel plate capacitor here, or this, uh, this is a capacitor electrode. These are two electrodes forming a capacitance. And you short circuit this by a little, uh, a little Josephson junction circuit. And the nonlinearity of this Josephson junction circuit means that to some degree you can approximate the oscillations of this circuit as a two level system. So that gives you uh, the atom of your cavity QED. Inside of this line, which would extend far outside of the edge of this building, uh, you, can, you can find microwave photons that bounce back and forth between two mirrors. And that gives you this, this cavity term here. And the fact that the electric fields of this photon traveling by polarized the, uh, the atom a little bit 
gives you a coupling between your, uh, your, uh, your atom and your cavity, which is typically written in this form here. This is uh, Jane's Cummings Hamiltonian, and this is a coupling that, for example, uh, destroys an excitation in the qubit and creates an excitation in the cavity, or vice versa. So this uh, was uh, first seen and engineered uh, and pioneered, really, in, in the group uh, in Yale, where people, uh, for example, uh, quite a long time ago, already saw this is in the case of a Cooper per box qubit. But if you, uh, if you put this together onto your chip, the very strong coupling that you can get in these circuits which comes from the fact that you can draw or control the shape and size of your atom however you want using the tools of the clean room, meant that these people, the people were able to achieve very quickly, say, what's called the strong coupling regime of circuit QED or cavity QED, where this, uh, if you tune your qubit into resonance with your cavity, these undergo an anticrossing, and the size of this anticrossing is much, much larger than, say, the intrinsic line width of the qubits, or of the uh, cavity itself. And this actually sort of kick-started uh, an entire field where uh, now actually the mass majority, in fact, all of groups trying to implement superconducting quantum computers do this using exactly the circuit QED architecture. This has become the de facto standard for, for really building uh, complex quantum circuits. So, uh, but actually, if you look at this Hamiltonian, this is actually an approximation. So if you write out the, the, what happens when you put a voltage on this, uh, on this pin, on this wire, and, and see how that couples to the uh, Hamiltonian of the qubit, it turns out that there are two extra terms. So in addition to these terms that swap excitations of the qubits and the cavity, there are also sort of funny-looking terms that will, for example, simultaneously destroy an excitation in the cavity and the qubit or simultaneously, in principle, sort of out of nothing, create an excitation in both the cavity and in the qubit. So uh, these terms in, for, for weak coupling, for this coefficient g, this, uh, if that weak coupling is weak, then actually these can be ignored. Uh, and that's what leads you to the typical James Cummings Hamiltonian. But if you start to increase the coupling, and that's something we can do by playing around with the geometry of our circuits, in principle, uh, you know, these terms can no longer be ignored. And uh, you know, uh, people often call, discuss these in terms of saying that there's uh, uh, sort of photons created out of nothing. And, and you might also say that you know, the ground state of your system can even have photons, virtual photons in the ground state. Uh, and so the question is uh, whether or not we can you know, start to observe effects of these terms in uh, the experiments uh, that we do. So to do that, we need to increase this coupling rate, G. And uh, this is a formula that we, we grabbed from uh, an old thesis. And this G is basically, there's two terms that, that I can easily play with. There's a term here, which is this CC over C sigma. This is a ratio of the capacitance of the island of your qubit to the cavity electrode where your photons are, are stored. So there's some coupling of the qubit to the cavity. And then the qubit also has capacitance to the rest of the universe. And, uh, and this CC over C sigma is a ratio of this coupling ca capacitance of your qubit to your ca cavity to the, its total capacitance. So this is some number in the experiments uh, in typical experiments in circuit QD, this is somewhere number around 10%. So in principle, there there is uh, some some uh, margin to win, and that's uh, actually what I'll tell you about today. There's another uh, there's another term in this expression that one can easily play with, and that's the well easily is the zero point fluctuations of the of the uh, photon cavity, and uh, and it turns out that if you make your if you increase the impedance of your cavity so go beyond 50 ohm impedance that we typically work with, then you can also enhance these zero-point fluctuations and therefore also enhance this coupling rate. And that's something that we did uh, actually kind of by accident a few years ago, uh, bringing this up to a couple hundred of ohms. And there's actually, I was in a thesis defense last Friday where people uh, in Grenoble have done, have pushed this up to very, very large values in the order of kilo-ohms or, or tens of kilo-ohms, even higher. So, uh, 
but what I'll tell you about today is uh, what we did is, uh, is made this ratio really, really big. And that brings me uh, to a description of the vacuum graph qubit. This is actually a project run by my, uh, my student, uh, Sal Bossman, uh, who is also coincidentally now starting up a company uh, in Delft called Delft Circuits. I'll advertise for him a bit. Uh, so this is some, sometimes we call this the, the Salmon uh, uh, qubit. Uh, so, uh, so this is what it looks like. Uh, like I said at the beginning, this, is, uh, this here is one of the island, well in fact this is a, a single island transmon qubit. Yale likes to make these, oh, these qubits that have two islands, uh, but we decided at some point to make this a single island, uh, and this is a little bit like an Xmon. Uh, everyone has to make up a new name, so that's why we call this the, the Salmon or Gabmon. Uh, some people think it looks like a toilet seat, so we sometimes call it a <laughs> toilet seat mon. Uh, uh, so, uh, but the, the key idea is that basically this is just a, a, a single island that is shorted to ground by our, our, our squid that contains two Josephson junctions here. And uh, a squid is sort of a handy tool because uh, it looks, so if you, if you really zoomed in here, you would see two little Josephson junctions, uh, tunnel junctions, and by making this loop, of superconducting loop in our, in our design, we can also effectively in situ tune the, the, if, the effective critical current of this junction. That means we can tune our qubit frequency by magnetic flux. What's the scale? How big is this? Uh, this is about 30 microns or so. So, uh, and, and now, as I remind you, so, well, in this case it turns out, but by design, we ended up with this ratio of about 0.88. And that should, in principle, dramatically enhance the coupling rate between our photons and our, cap and our atom. So uh, you might ask, why did we do this? Uh, that's a sort of a funny story. Uh, we did this actually not to make, uh, well, by the time we started this experiment, we realized this should probably give us ultra-strong uh, coupling. But one of the other, the main goals we were looking for is to try to, uh, to make uh, our qubit sensitive to vibrations of the suspended drum. And, uh, it's, and, and basically the reason why we did it like this is because we found a very tri a neat little electrical engineering trick for applying large voltages on, on our microwave cavity, large DC voltages, which should, in principle, have given us coupling between the vibrations of this drum and the state of this qubit. Uh, and, and so we were really hoping to see something like this, where, uh, where we would see uh, our qubit, as we applied a voltage to increase the coupling between our qubit and our drum, we were hoping to see this qubit split into a whole sequence of qubit lines corresponding to individual phonon states of our drum. Uh, and uh, the this, this splitting here is given by this term, well, that's an interesting question, given by this term g squared over delta. So we were working with a 10 megahertz drum and a, and a, a very large frequency qubit. And uh, so you might say that this would be hopeless because the delta would be really large, but it turned out in our design we can make G really big. So we thought we'd be very clever and make G really big and overcome this, uh, this uh, small, this large detuning problem. Uh, it turns out that my student, my master's student working with Sal, uh, when he started his PhD, Mario, he started to look at this more analy analytically uh, he did a perturbation expansion for the coupling between our drum and our qubit, and we started including counter-rotating terms, which this usual term of g squared over delta does not. And then we had a little bit of a surprise, which was not so good for him in month two of his PhD, that actually uh, you follow this line, and it turns out that the coupling we expected is some four or five orders of magnitude smaller than we expected. Uh, due to the result of these counter terms. So we rediscovered why a, a transmon qubit is so insensitive to, to charge noise. Uh, so, uh, so that was kind of a bit of a disappointment, but uh, nonetheless, it turns out that, that the sort of backup plan of this device, which was, uh, was to increase this cavity coupling, that did actually really work. So <clears throat> I want to show you that now. So uh, uh, the experiment we did is pretty simple. We just did spectroscopy. We put the qubit and the cavity together on the chip. We cooled it down, and then we put, we did, uh, we put microwave photons in to probe the state of our qubit uh, as a function of flux. This is the magnetic flux in this little squid loop that's going to tune our qubit energy. 
And so this is what we saw. So this blue line, this blue line here is the frequency of our microwave cavity. This vertical blue line here is the qubit being tuned as a function of flux. This is quite a zoom in, so this looks like almost like a vertical line. And, uh, and what you see here is this is, uh, this here is this vacuum Rabi splitting. This is the anti-crossing of our qubit and our cavity states. And uh, we can take a line cut, and you can see that our vacuum Rabi splitting is quite large. So our vacuum Rabi splitting is 1.2 gigahertz. And this is now almost the same. This is about 20% of the total energy of our qubit transition, which is around 5 gigahertz. Uh, so that, in principle, shows us already that we're already quite deep in this ultra-strong coupling regime. Well, I mean, so people usually have a finger in the air that ultra-strong coupling starts at g over omega is 10%, and so we got 20%, so we were pretty happy. Uh, so, but we wanted to push this a little bit further, because uh, in principle we wanted to extract how much of the spectroscopy that we're seeing in this plot arises from these strange counter-rotating terms of our Hamiltonian. Uh, and so we did that. Uh, that's shown by the green line. So the green line here, that shows the calculation of the, of the eigenstates of our system if we remove the counter-rotating terms. Uh, so this is about the splitting, the difference between this red line and this green line, that's about 62 megahertz. And, uh, and that shows us that we're really, uh, our, our line width is, is not great, actually, it's about 2 megahertz, but in, nonetheless, we're more than a factor of 30 resolved, resolving this splitting between uh, the frequency shift from the counter-rotating terms of the Hamiltonian. Uh, for the experts, you might look a little bit, we also saw, saw a kind of funny thing. Uh, this is a bit of an aside, but if you're interested and you look carefully, actually, this line here, he does not form a nice parabola, as one would sort of in think at first. Actually, as we tune our qubit down to very, very low frequencies, there's a it looks like there's some sort of transition where the, the qubit suddenly decouples from the cavity, uh, as if the light matter interaction uh, between the qubit and the cavity is quenched. And uh, actually, we think that this is related to the fact that this device is now being tuned to very, our qubit transition is now getting detuned to sort of tens of megahertz and our qubit is becoming thermally occupied. And so we think this is actually a, a thermally induced uh, decoupling uh, of the qubit from the, from the cavity. Uh, and this is sort of possibly, it's, 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 it sort of becomes visible here is the idea because our qubit is now you know, gigahertz and gigahertz detuned, but because of this very large coupling, uh, he still dresses the cavity a small bit. And so this is still observable, this decoupling. So, uh, now, this is, of course, what's, uh, what gave us a bit of a trouble, and that's what I'll tell you about in a minute, is, uh, is actually, of course, there are more modes. This is a coplanar waveguide cavity, so there are actually lots and lots of modes in our, in our photon cavity. And we can, uh, we can actually tune our qubit to higher frequencies, to quite high frequencies, and we can also observe the second, the splitting of the, of the qubit with the second higher mode. In this device, actually, the coupling to the first mode was a little bit lower, but in the, uh, you can see at this higher mode, this is the second device, our crossing uh, gave us our, anti our vacuum Rabi splitting with a second mode was something like 1.8 gigahertz. Um, and, uh, and actually, you can interpret this, if you want, as being due to the fact that the higher frequency modes have ze larger zero-point fluctuations in their voltage. So, uh, so this is, uh, that's, that's the, the main part of our experimental result. Uh, but we had a bit of a problem, because as you can see, if we go back here, our, we rely an awful lot on this green line. In fact, all of our evidence of the difference between the, the effect of the counter rotating terms is in the difference between this green theory line and this red line. And so it's quite important that we get a very good, a very good theory to understand uh, this line. And that's something that gave us some problems. Uh, because actually, as you can imagine, we could also fit these black experimental lines with, uh, with the green line if we just adjust our parameters a bit. And it would fit. And so, uh, and so uh, we had to really trust this green line. 
And now uh, that led us to a bit of a problem uh, because uh, uh, we ran into uh, some old problems in circuit QED and even in uh, quantum electrodynamics. And that's, uh, that problem is what happens to my model as I add more modes. So, uh, you know, we have a James, I mean, we can do this even with James Cummings. This doesn't even require us to worry about the counter-routing terms. So, uh, so the problem is the following, you know, if we have one mode, we have, you know, this coupling here. If we add another mode, you would just say, okay, I'll add another, uh, we have A1 and A2 now, and I'll add another G here. And if I add a third mode, I'll uh, put another A and another G. So that seems quite reasonable, right? Uh, I could just keep doing that. The problem is that uh, this G, he scales already, as I told you, with the square root of the mode number. And that leads to a bit of a problem. And I'll sort of illustrate that uh, in a very cartoon form. The idea is that if I have my cavity in my qubits uh, and I put them together and couple them, then the qubit will undergo some sort of a shift. You can call it the Lamb shift that you want, where he gets pushed down in energy. And now the problem is the following. If I had another mode, this mode is higher in frequency, so the shift is smaller. But uh, it's not quite small enough because of the scaling of the square root of n of this g. And the problem is, is actually that if you keep adding modes, this qubit keeps getting shifted to lower and lower frequencies. And in fact, the, the result, if you follow this procedure here, it doesn't converge. Uh, and uh, so, so sometimes people in, 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 in circuit QED, they take the size of their qubit, and they say, OK, at some point when the wavelength of my photon becomes comparable to the size of my qubit, then I can start putting a cutoff in. And then my, that gives me convergence, and, uh, and I'm done. But the problem with our very tiny little qubit is that we are, to justify this, we would need to cut off at 35 modes. And at 35 modes, the, the lamb shift is already 27 gigahertz. So, so this makes no sense. And so we were kind of, my students were kind of frustrated with this because we needed this, this silly green line to be able to claim uh, how many, uh, what the effect of the counter-ordering terms are. So, uh, so uh, we, we looked a little bit in the literature and there are lots of discussions about gauge theories and, uh, and, and, uh, and renormalization of electromagnetic uh, couplings. Uh, and, but we were sort, of, were sort of a little bit more engineering oriented, so, uh, and, uh, so we took a, a funny approach. And the idea is that we want to somehow take this coplanar waveguide, which in principle has an infinite number of modes, and we want to truncate that at a fixed number of modes and see what the couplings are uh, and do a calculation and add another mode and see what happens if we do that. So how do we do this? This, of course, you can write as a, a continuous uh, distributed uh, series of L's and C's, but that's not a very handy way of writing it down for truncating modes. But it turns out there's something called a Foster decomposition, which is, says that if I take this coplanar waveguide, I can write it down as actually a simple series of discrete LC's. And uh, a series sum of parallel LC's like this, and uh, where these C's are all the same, and this inductance uh, uh, follows this uh, pattern here, it gets smaller for, as you add modes. And this is, it turns out this is an exact decomposition of the full frequency dependent impedance of this transmission line. So I want to illustrate that. This shows uh, the tangent function uh, that is uh, the, uh, the impedance of the transmission line, the, the analytical solution. And now I'm going to plot, if I cut this off at one mode, this is our Foster decomposition for one mode. What you see is it exactly produces the singularity of a single mode but then loses all of the change, the high frequency impedance for multiple modes. If I put two modes, it catches the second one, but not the third. If I put three modes, it catches the three modes. And you can see also that adding these extra modes still tweaks a little bit this inductance, this impedance down here. And for example, this uh, is what you get if you include 10 modes. And at least on this plot, uh, things are starting to uh, look like these lines are overlapping. So uh, what is nice about this is that we've now reduced our, our, our coplanar waveguides with a discrete, uh, in principle, a, a very complicated set of distributed LCs, 
by a simple lumped element circuit. And a lumped element circuit, if we read the, uh, the uh, lecture notes of Michel Deveret, it tells us how to, to quantize the circuit. So our approach is basically going to be to see what happens as we add more modes in our, quantum, in our circuit. We're going to put in a fixed number of modes, calculate the Hamiltonian, and then uh, and see what we get. Now, there's actually a very important subtle point here, and that's, uh, that's <coughs> how do we pick uh, what we call the bare qubit. Because when we quantize this, we're just going to get a whole bunch, we're going to get a circuit that's going to have a bunch of modes, but we want to translate this to a quantum Rabi model where we have some sort of bare qubit modes and some sort of bare, cav bare cavity modes. And there we have to make some sort of a choice. And uh, the choice that my PhD student made is to call uh, the bare atom, the bare atom we define as something where there are only currents flowing through this nonlinear inductor. And then we'll call the bare uh, cavity modes of this quantization, the, the, we're going to call those ones the, any mode that has currents only flowing through linear inductors. This is, somebody later told me once this is equivalent to gauge uh, uh, freedom in, in, in cavity electrodynamics. So, uh, but we're just going to pick that because it seemed like a logical choice and we're going to see what happens. So we can take this, we can write it out, it's basically just writing out the Hamiltonian uh, and you can translate this into uh, restricting yourself to the 0-1 manifold, you can translate this into a quantum Rabi model, Hamiltonian. And what we're going to get is just the coupling constants. We're going to start by looking only at the coupling constants. So first of all, you know, frank, thankfully, uh, as you expect, the, cu the, the coupling of, to mode m, so little m is going to be the mode number, and big m is going to be how many modes we included in total in our, in our calculation. So uh, this, G, this m squares, squares sort of like we expect as a square root of m, which is good. But now something funny started to happen when we added more modes. And in particular, what we saw was as if we added changed big M, the total number of modes, actually all of these coupling constants got changed. They all got uh, shifted downwards. It looks like they're being sort of renormalized. Uh, but we haven't put any renormalization in. We've just run a circuit. So, uh, so uh, you can see this in this plot. If you look at the first, the coupling the, to the m equals 1 mode, uh, as we change the total number of modes, actually this scales down like this. So what was also kind of funny is that with our choice of the bare qubit mode, actually as we add more modes to our circuit, the apparent atomic bare energy, he diverges. So this, 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 this is the atomic energy as we've defined it, the bare qubit energy, and he just goes to infinity as we add an infinite number of modes. Uh, yeah, this is kind of weird. Uh, actually, there is some nice intuitive understanding about where that comes from. So in this, I've neglected this capacitor completely. And if this guy here is only, if I look at modes that, that only include currents through this, and not through these linear inductors, then this inductor here, this, this sort of linear element, has to resonate only with these capacitors. And a series sum of an infinite number of capacitors has infinite impedance. And so this inductor, when we go to m equals infinity, he doesn't have any capacitors to resonate with. And that's why our bare atomic energy, he diverges. So, uh, so, in principle, what we can then do is we've now got our Hamiltonian. We can just plug it in, uh, pick a certain number of photon note levels, pick a certain number of transmon levels, and, and, and diagonalize it. And uh, this is what we get. So what the dashed line here is actually we're benchmarking ourselves against black box quantization, which is a, a procedure known to work very well, actually. Uh, but the disadvantage of black box quantization is you get no quantum Rabi model. It's just a black box. You just get the answer. Uh, so, and we were after 
the first step, which is how do you get to the answer. And so what's, uh, if we do this and using uh, our, 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 our approach, these, you see these blue lines converge very quickly to the black box answer, and these red lines are what would happen if you just plugged in uh, sort of the same, the square root of m dependence without renormalizing anything, then we, you would get indeed this diverging lamb shift uh, as we add already to four modes for our device. So, uh, so okay, so it works. Uh, it's a bit strange because we have this sort of maybe unphysical bare model where all these parameters are, 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 are being renormalized as we change the, the cutoff of the number of modes. But this somehow produces convergence that we want. Now, the one thing that's, that sort of bothered me a little bit is that what is the meaning of these G's, in my, these renormalized G's? And in particular, you know, in circuit QED, you're accustomed to saying that the vacuum Rabi splitting is given by the, by the coupling to the first mode, the, the, the G to that mode. But now, the G to that mode depends on how many total number of modes I've included. So, uh, how does that work? So, uh, you know, let's take, for example, one mode and one qubit. You put them into resonance. They undergo a splitting. Uh, but now, what happens if I put another mode in? So, if I put another mode in, first my bare atomic energy goes up. Uh, also, my, my Gs are all renormalized, actually down. Uh, so, uh, but now, if I want to understand what happens when this qubit is crossing with this mode, what I need to do is I need to integrate out the other modes. I want to dress the qubit already by the interaction with all the remaining modes. And if I do that in this case, if I dress this qubit with this mode, he gets pushed back down in energy. And it turns out that if you look at the, the math, this, this coupling also gets changed by this dressing of the mode. And it turns out that actually for a transmond limit, it turns out that this dressing exactly restores you to what you had for the single mode model. And so this is sort of how, and, and that gives us the fact that the vacuum Abbey splitting is still given by what I expect it to be. Uh, just a coupling I would have had for my first mode. And that means that that gives me some faith that if I do things properly, the, the vacuum Abbey splitting is independent of the number of modes I include in my model. So, uh, the last thing that you might want to think about is I've completely neglected the capacitance of my junction. Any real qubit always has some capacitance there. And what is the physics of that capacitor? What does it do? Well, I've been talking so far about the square root m divergence of the couplings. What this, what this capacitance does is actually it cuts off the coupling to higher modes. And you can even understand that relatively simply. Uh, this capacitance is like a little short circuit to ground at the end of my coplanar waveguides. For, uh, for large enough frequencies, this capacitance, this is no longer an open-ended coplanar wave, you know, waveguide, but a, a short-circuited. And that means this position gets shifted from a voltage anti-node at low frequencies to a voltage node at high frequencies. And that gives this cutoff of all the couplings. So this cutoff, uh, of course, will help my, my, my convergence because it's reducing the coupling to higher modes, but it's actually not necessary. That's what I find most interesting. If you do this procedure properly, it converges independent of the total number, independent, you know, even without this capacitance, it always converges. And in fact, if you want to get sort of a correct quantum Rabi model for fixed number of modes, you, you, you cannot just put this convergence in, this capacitance in to get to the correct translation to the quantum Rabi model. So um, let's see. So uh, there's one last uh, thing that came up to us uh, that came, uh, became a little bit of a question we had when we were working on this, we started to realize that much of what we're seeing is basically just uh, circuit theory. Uh, in fact, much of, especially in the transmond limits, everything that these vacuum Rabi splittings, uh, they started to feel an awful lot like just something would happen with an LC circuit. Uh, and so we started to ask ourselves, and people also started to ask us at conferences, you know, how quantum is any of this anyway? Is any of this quantum? So, uh, you know, because this original idea was that this, this vacuum splitting, or at least the language people used, was that this, this splitting here is a splitting that is driven by the, vo the quantum fluctuations of your cavity. And that's partially because this G has a formula that has VZPF in it. 
So, but the question, but of course, uh, and in fact, there's even people, uh, friends and colleagues of mine, actually, uh, and collaborators, uh, who, who, who have used uh, this measure of the dispersive shift between the qubit state and, and the theoretical line here as, as a measure, a quantitative measure, experimentally, of the zero-point fluctuations of the cavity. So, uh, so the question, no, so, but this is, uh, so what we were doing a lot, and this is my favorite uh, tool, this is QUCS, it's a circuit simulator, open source, you could download it today, and if you just draw this circuit, you can do a parameter sweep of this inductor and make your own vacuum Abbey splittings. Uh, and so that's what I did. Uh, so this is actually a, a quantum QUCS uh, vacuum Abbey splitting. I'm sweeping the state of my qubit. It's anti-crossing with a bunch of cavity modes. Uh, this is, of course, this circuit simulator has h bar equals to zero. Uh, and so, uh, in principle, it's very clear that you get crossings when uh, you have h bar equals zero. Also, sort of this intuition that the, the higher modes have larger splittings, they have larger zero point fluctuations is also reproduced in my, in my software. Uh, and uh, this is, of course, actually just normal mode splitting. This is, if I have two classical masses on springs and I can get connected with an extra spring and I bring them in resonance, they anti-cross in their eigenvalues. This is Lagrangian mechanics, uh, classic problem for second year undergraduate students. Uh, so, uh, and actually the, impedance, the understanding here is actually the, the splitting increases because of better impedance matching. Is a nice classical uh, Dewey interpretation of this. So, uh, we kind of ask the question, you know, <laughs> you know uh, this is maybe aggressive, but how quantum is this? Uh, is, there, is there a lot of quantum? Is there a little bit of quantum? Is there no quantum at all uh, in, in these lamb shifts, well, quote unquote? So, uh, our approach uh, is, is basically to do something that is, is sort of black box analytically. So black box is sort of a black box quantization says you, uh, you treat your circuit uh, linear, you solve the whole linear analysis of your circuit first, you know, for arbitrarily complicated frequency dependent impedance. Uh, you calculate the normal modes and you add the, the, the nonlinearity as a perturbation quantum mechanically. So we did that sort of, but then with very simple things like a parallel LC circuit. Uh, this is sort of, uh, you know, this is actually a good way to understand the transmon qubits. Uh, if it's just a, you have a slightly nonlinear inductor, and as you go up in level, you are essentially rectifying the nonlinearity, sort of rectifying the quantum fluctuations of the particle in the well, and that gives you an extra shift uh, uh, here, which is your anharmonicity of your level spectrum. So we did the same thing, uh, but then by putting here now a cavity and a qubit. Uh, and, uh, and, we, and the procedure is the following. We first calculate the normal modes, which gives us a shift here, this black shift to all of these lines. And then we add the anharmonicity, and part of that comes from the qubit's, what I'll call self-care, its own quantum fluctuations being renorm uh, rectified by the nonlinearity. But there's also a small bit, which is here, which is the quantum fluctuations of the cavity being rectified by the qubit's nonlinearity. And that is, that is what I'll call, uh, if you want, the true lamb shift in the spirit of the original formulation. At least this is the part that will vanish if I set the, cav the quantum fluctuations of my cavity to zero. Uh, and so, uh, so using this, this perturbation, we, this is uh, an analytical solution you can get actually for weak anharmonicity. And uh, you can see that uh, it's actually kind of a funny thing that, uh, that the dispersive shift is always g squared over delta in the, in the rotating wave approximation, independent of whether you're a perfectly linear harmonic oscillator or you're an infinitely anharmonic two-level system. It's always g squared over delta. And what changes is the fraction of that g squared of a delta that comes from quantum fluctuations. So a two-level system has all of its quantum fluctuations, g squared over delta, from, uh, from uh, all of its dispersive shift from quantum fluctuations. A harmonic oscillator has none of its shift from, uh, from quantum fluctuations. And uh, transmon qubits kind of live in this regime or over here around 5% anharmonicity. And uh, in our experiment, and the estimate was about 20%, of our vacuum, a dispersive shift comes from, or our lamb-like shift comes from quantum fluctuations. <laughs>
And it was also kind of fun. We, my PhD student uh, looked up in the literature some of the works with Rydberg Adams. Uh, and I, I asked him again this morning for the numbers, but he's at the dentist, so he couldn't give me uh, the exact details. But if I remember correctly, uh, we, had, we estimated that actually for Rydberg atoms, this number is something like 70%. So even something so extremely quantum as a Rydberg atom in its sort of dispersive shift in the cavity interaction still has about 30% of what I'll call normal mode splitting. Uh, so, and sort of a good rule is uh, if you want to know how quantum your lamp shift is, let's say, what you need to do is you need to compare your, uh, basically compare your single photon. Uh, if you observe photon number splitting, you compare this, the spacing of your single photon dispersive shift to the lamp shift because the quantum part of that, quantum part of the lamp shift is actually always half of the quantum fluctuations, the, the photon uh, number dispersive shift. So uh, with that, I'll finish. Uh, I told you a little bit about this funny vacuum gap qubits. It's a compact qubit with ultrasound coupling. It led us to sort of a, an interesting way of thinking about uh, these ultrasound coupling limits and this uh, lamp shift problem, and a little bit about, uh, about uh, the nature of how quantum the lamp shift is itself. So with that, I'd like to thank, of course, the people who did the real work. This is a recent picture of the team. And uh, these people were also involved in uh, experiments, theory, and theoretical support from Bilbao, uh, from the group of Enrico Solano, who was very helpful in understanding our, our results quantitatively. And I'll end with an advertisement. In principle, we uh, have uh, postdoc positions available. So if there's something interesting, uh, or if this sounds interesting to someone you know, uh, please let them uh, point them to my website. Thank you. We have time for some question. Yeah. So you had this plot where, curiously, the shift of the cavity was absolutely quenched to zero when the qubit was shifted very far away, and you somehow said something about it's about thermal uh, excitations of the qubit. So is the way to understand this that? the qubit rapidly flips up and down because of thermal excitations, and that would give positive, negative, positive, negative shift, and it's so rapid that it completely cancels instead of just giving two peaks uh, for the cavity? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, the thing is, I don't think that the, that the, the, the qubit, it does not, it's not symmetric about zero, actually, the shift. Uh, so we've done some work to reproduce this in, 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 in we basically just put a thermal state in the Q-tip, this sort of uh, numerical thing. And uh, we, did we did see signatures of sort of bar-like features that arise in, in the, the dressed cavity. This, by the way, is also the same thing what happens if you, if you bring the qubit and, and cavity close together and start pumping really hard. Then at some critical driving threshold, the, the cavity decouples from the qubit and jumps to what people call the bear frequency. And actually, as we turn up the power, this bar just starts to grow. Uh, and so we kind of know that this is the right place, but we think that this is, in, in this case, this decoupling driven by just the thermal fluctuations of the qubit at low frequencies. Other questions? Yes. So the question of um, where quantum fluctuations come in in matter field interactions is a, is a slippery business. <laughs> and, and you may know, you know, back in the ancient days, uh, there was this whole question not for the lamp shift, but for the spontaneous emission rate. How much was due to radiation reaction versus how much was due to quantum fluctuations? And it's, it can be a slippery business. I mean, a lot of that work was done, you know, here in Paris by Cohen Zanuji and Jean Dalibar and others about the question of operator ordering. You can, uh, you know, attribute some amount to just radiation reaction, classical type uh, effects, some to uh, uh, quantum fluctuations, but they're sort of two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I wonder if there's a similar kind of thing that you can sort of flip things around, what part, what you're calling a quantum fluctuation, what you're calling classical, that these are, you know, these are slippery concepts. I don't know if you've made the connections to that old work or you've thought about that at all. Uh, that's, a, that's something we should definitely look up, actually. Uh, it's a, yeah, it's an interesting one. Uh, 
I, I can easily imagine. <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the, you know, I, uh, indeed, it's a little bit, uh, you know, what for me at least is pretty kind of clear or simple is that you know, if I just artificially set the zero point fluctuations to zero, then this guy disappears. But this guy doesn't, right? And so, uh, yeah, yeah. I think actually a lot of the discussion is indeed a little bit driven by the approximation of a multi-level system as a, as a two-level system as well. Because we also do that here in, in our qubits. Our qubit is not a two-level system. It doesn't have a sigma plus. It's an, it's an A operator. And it's only in the approximation that, that we, set it, we set a sigma there instead of an A dagger. That, that we get uh, this. So I th I'm also very curious how much. And of course, atoms are also not real two level systems. Uh, so that's an interesting, uh, interesting question. Yes? Um, on the slide where you estimated the effective G yes. by eliminating the higher modes, I guess I was just curious methodologically what, was it a straightforward type of elimination or, or what? The, this, or. Yeah, uh, that's, I'm not sure, actually, because <laughs> I didn't do it. <laughs> uh, I, I know that, that basically if you, if you neglect the capacitance of the qubit, uh, the quantum Rabi model just falls out directly out of the, out of the, the quantization. Uh, if you include the capacitance of the qubit, things get very complicated because you get all these mixing terms. And for that, uh, the people in Bilbao did a Bogolyubov transformation of some sort to, uh, to get these Gs when we include this, uh, this capacitor. Okay, no other questions. So it's time for the coffee break.